Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at RAF Fairford for the annual Royal International Air Tattoo, world's leading gathering of air power leaders as well as aircraft from around the world, including uh, senior retired uh, air chiefs uh, as well. Uh, our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS, and we're honored to see my old friend, uh, Italian General Vincenzo Caparini, uh, who is former chief of the Italian Air Force, former chief of the Italian uh, Defense Staff, uh, head of uh, the uh, Italian uh, War College, uh, former senior NATO official, now with the Italian Institute for International Studies. Just a retired general <laughs> who speaks on his behalf. Exactly. You're, you're not speaking on anybody else's behalf but yours. But it was uh, a real pleasure, sir, seeing you again here. And I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, we just came off the heels of uh, what can be seen only as a very disruptive NATO summit. Uh, the American president obviously trying to increase pressure on European governments to spend more money on defense. Um, that's been a rising trend anyway. He called for 4% of defense spending. He said there was an agreement on that, but Emmanuel Macron and almost every other leader of the alliance has said there was no agreement on, on that point. From, from your standpoint as a former senior officer, as a thinker and a strategist, what are the implications here? What was good about this NATO meeting, but also what is potentially very worrisome from your standpoint? Uh, I believe that uh, if we want to be optimistic, we can see that there is a kind of line of continuity. The issue about budget sharing is not new. Uh, I recall in the late 60s, uh, uh, someone was already talking about that. Uh, and uh, I perceive a difference of tone, not a difference of arguments. Uh, the issue of, about going from 2 to 4 percent, I think, is total nonsense. Uh, and I do not believe that even the president himself thinks it is uh, something which is achievable. Uh, the issue of 2 percent instead, it has been a decision taken by the chiefs of the government and the chief of states in the ways in 2014. Uh, it was a political engagement <clears throat> in order to reach this amount by the year 2024. So we are not even at the half of this period uh, and uh, the trend, uh, uh, a positive trend can be already perceived. Whether all of the uh, members will achieve the 2% is doubtful. I believe that it will be difficult for my country, it will be difficult for Germany, uh, not because Ger the Germans do not have the money, but because they do not have plans enough to spend so much money. Uh, but having said that, uh, what is really disturbing is really the tone, how uh, the argument has been presented by the, by the President of the United States. Uh, uh, this is typical of this individual. I believe that uh, you can perceive the same situation uh, in all the other meetings he had, but nevertheless, uh, he is in a way uh, reducing the, the amount of uh, uh, resilience of the alliance uh, in, the, in this period. And this is bad. This is really bad. And we need to go ahead on, uh, instead because uh, the pressure from all the crises we have around the world will require NATO to be absolutely in a, in a, in a mood of solidarity. Uh, NATO is such... Uh, uh, to remain the alliance, the only real military alliance in the world which can work. Do you, are you concerned that, I mean, there are some people who are saying, look, NATO as we know it is dead, that we have to look at a new construct. Um, there are forces, uh, even very uh, uh, devoted NATO countries that are beginning to consider, do we need to have a, a more of a European military capability? Because the concern is the United States that this drifting started, uh, you know, you were air chief and uh, there was um, a lot of harsh language between Washington and its allies over the Iraq war. Italy decided to participate in that, other allies didn't, uh, and it became a point of friction. Um, the Obama administration um, wasn't turning its back on Europe, but said, look, you guys work closer together. We have to be focused in the Middle East and over in Asia. You guys work together, yeah. get stronger. We're more pro sort of EU being a forming function, but still that NATO was the core of the alliance. Are you concerned that there will be a breakdown of the alliance? And what are the implications of that? Because, and, and will it be reflected, for example, in acquisition decisions also? Many countries, Italy, braved a lot of even internal Italian criticism to go with the F-35. Obviously, the Italian aerospace industry thought, sought that as a yeah. disaster. Talk to us a little bit about each of these dynamics. Well, uh, first of all, I believe that uh, in 
in some form NATO will continue to exist because we need it. And uh, in the future I can see many situations in which uh, the military instrument shall be uh, required to operate at the service of the political environment, of the political scopes of the members of the alliance. Uh, this requires a, a, a different type of dialogue, uh, however. Uh, a dialogue uh, which uh, must be open, uh, must be uh, mindful of uh, all the limits and the peculiarities of each single member. Uh, we are so many, each of us is different from the others, so uh, uh, there is nothing which is uh, uh, good for all. Uh, we have to be uh, patient and to be extremely focused on the future. This is true for NATO, this is true for the European environment. Uh, even uh, the European uh, uh, Union uh, tries to do something in defense, uh, but again the uh, uh, national identities, the national priorities, the national interest uh, sometimes are conflicting. Uh, we must uh, perform a very active uh, role in trying to uh, to manage these differences in order not to them uh, to make them disruptive. Uh, we have to be successful. We must be successful because uh, the world is changing, changing fast, and uh, uh, I don't want to use the word threats or risks. Or uh, uh, we will need to face challenges of different kind. Either we do them, we, we do that uh, uh, jointly together, or we will fail. Uh, in particular, Europe is made of many small different countries. Even Germany itself is a small country. It cannot sustain by itself the pressure which will come from the outside. Do you see America's allies separating from the United States? And do you think that that will be reflected, for example, in acquisition decisions? I've had senior European officials tell me, listen, an acquisition is five decades in the future. Given some of the rhetoric we're hearing that, you know, and, and President Trump made it clear, everybody pays 4% or we're out of here, I believe, uh, or that's been attributed to him, um, you know, that, that that also increases concerns. Our allies may be willing for the United States or, or the American president to be engaged, but he may not want to be doing that. Do you think that that changes dynamic? Does it drive Europe to work more closely, for example, on weapons programs, even if there are very good American systems people may be interested in? Uh, let me talk about, a little bit about uh, industrial cooperation with the two sides of the ocean. Uh, so far, some attempts have been made. Uh, most of them have failed. Uh, and not because of technical reasons, but because of political attitudes. Uh, let's take the example of the MIATS, the uh, surface to air missile, anti-ballistic uh, anti missile. Uh, that was a very sound program. Uh, for some reason, uh, it didn't, didn't go through. Uh, now we have a follow-up uh, with Germany, but uh, the cooperation between the two sides of the Atlantic uh, was not working. And, and for our audience, that was the medium extended air defense system, which was a partnership between the United States, Germany, and Italy. For Italy and Germany, it was a national missile defense system. For the United States, it was a theater-wide missile defense system that was aiming to address shortcomings elsewhere in air defense environments, which the other companies, Lockheed and Patriot and Raytheon, have been investing in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we must find new ways of cooperating, which will require some uh, political uh, change in the attitude. Uh, we know the restrictions uh, about t technology transfer and technology acquisition uh, from the Congress. Uh, that must be uh, an issue to be taken care of. Uh, otherwise, uh, I, will perceive, I perceive that in the future we will have a consolidation of the European industry, uh, which will become a, a strong competitor for the American industry. <clears throat> we need competition. But uh, do we need to fight, to fight each other? I don't believe so. We need to be able to cooperate. And uh, this will, uh, uh, again, require a lot of political new thinking, which, which I hope uh, uh, will be in the minds of our leaders. Uh, I'm very optimistic because today I do not see much of this in the minds of our leaders. Do you think that a combination of Brexit as well as the rhetoric from the American president, will empower Putin to test the alliance in a way that people don't expect. Putin wants to win without fighting. 
and the challenge always is how he's constantly undermining governments, whether trying to undermine the Italian government, whether trying to undermine France, uh, Russian fingerprints in Brexit, and obviously the assassination attempts here. How do you see that dynamic? Do you think that this disunity gives him an opportunity to not only take advantage of it, but use that opportunity to further divide and fracture the alliance? I perceive this attitude to be very short-minded, both on the Washington side as well as on the Moscow side. Uh, the evidence is that uh, uh, in some areas of these uh, capitals, there is the will to keep uh, Europe divided and uh, fable. I believe that this is uh, wrong for the future because we need uh, each other. Uh, the US will need Europe. Uh, and a strong Europe. Uh, Russia cannot sustain itself without being allied with Europe uh, because the pressure which we will receive from the East and from the South is such that uh, we can face it uh, only if we are together. The US, uh, Europe and Russia. But do you think that this gives opportunity for, for Russia to try something that we don't expect that will be short of an assault that would trigger an Article 5 but be significant enough to test the alliance? Uh, so far I believe that uh, Mr. Putin has shown that uh, uh, he is not a gentleman but he is not a fool. Uh, so I don't believe he will do anything uh, uh, really harmful. Uh, he will keep on keeping the pressure uh, but again uh, uh, a, a, jump in, a different quantum jump must be done in policy. Uh, and uh, uh, we are working. I am part of a, an informal group to work about uh, confidence building measures, uh, mutual understanding, so that we uh, can overcome the differences we have today. Uh, we'll reduce the uh, mutual uh, perceived uh, distrust. 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 Uh, which which can be done. I mean, men of goodwill can do that. Uh, we are working on that. Let me uh, ask you uh, about uh, the future combat aircraft program. Um, France and Germany have uh, teamed up. Uh, Tom Enders has said, you know, there have been news reports that Britain may work with uh, Sweden, but Britain has also agreed to work with Turkey in the development of a new combat aircraft, which may be a complicating element in this dimension. Um, talk to us a little bit, as you look through the future, you were a big advocate for the F-35 program, as every Italian air chief has been. There is a final assembly and checkout facility, which is in Italy, one of the only other countries uh, to have that kind of a capability. Turkey, of course, has a long-term engine uh, sustainment and support uh, contract for European F-35 operators. Talk to us a little bit about, as people start to look to the future of air power, what does that future need to look like? What does a new European combat aircraft need to look like? And what are the countries that should participate in its development? Well, I will uh, answer from an Italian perspective. And uh, uh, we are in a fairly complicated political moment. And I believe that uh, the effort which is now uh, the masterpiece which we have to, to, to to, to, to search is uh, uh, the continuation of the F-35 program as it has been conceived and it has been planned. Uh, I have no idea whether there is any intention to join or to open a new uh, program for a combat aircraft. Uh, what, I, what I can say is that uh, the uh, initiatives you mentioned are the evidence that uh, again Europe is making the mistake of uh, working on different projects. Can we afford it? I don't think so because uh, uh, it, will, it will not be worthwhile to produce uh, different types of aircraft, different types of weapon systems, of, of combat system. So I, uh, I hope that uh, eventually we will come out uh, with uh, a single program uh, shared by all the European nations uh, although I see some difficulties because when uh, Germany and France say that uh, this is a Franco-German program, the others may join later if we like it. Uh, this is not the right attitude. Uh, so far uh, I've seen a lot of, uh, read a lot of words, uh, not seen much action. One last question about um, the evolution of air power. Um, the U.S 
uh, and Allied investments have been on ever more sophisticated aircraft. The F-35 is a stealthy aircraft that can penetrate airspace and drop bombs on it. But that requires highly skilled pilots, sophisticated industrial base to develop, and they're so expensive we buy handfuls of them. And the pilots are so expensive, they're difficult and expensive to maintain and train. Our adversaries, however, have decided that now that there is better long-range weaponry with precision and can deliver mass at range, and they can be built in very large numbers, put in boxes, and they don't need any training and retirement programs. So how is air power changing, and how is war fighting changing as you look at guys like Putin, for example, who's using cyber, information? Talk to us about both of these dimensions, you know, because in a sense you could look at it as Air, the fundamental application of long range, you know, the Air Force, one of the key Air Force roles is to project power at range. If you're now starting to do that with long range missile really that's precise and can do some of these things, it changes the dynamic. Talk to us about how air power is changing and how warfare is changing and air power's role in that new environment. Well, I believe the, um, the, the real change has been the introduction of the F-35 in service because the F-35 is not the new aircraft which replaces uh, the old ones. It's an element of the uh, complicated game you just described. Uh, the F-35 is an element of the cyber warfare, is an element of the information warfare, uh, is an element of the uh, kinetic warfare. Uh, it's something totally new. <clears throat> it will change uh, the, the use of the air power because the air power will be pervasive, uh, much more than it has been done in the past. Uh, we will talk again of uh, closer support of things like that but that will be uh, of uh, less relevance in terms of strategic concept uh, the systems which uh, we will need uh, will require uh, this extra uh, intelligent capability which uh, so far we have been missing uh, artificial intelligence is uh, one of the uh, the password of today uh, and that for sure will be fitted into the new systems. Uh, and of course, air power will be the uh, thing which will allow our countries, our governments, uh, to uh, be perceived uh, everywhere, regardless of distance, uh, as uh, uh, possible actors in any possible crisis. Sir, uh, General Vincenzo Camperini, former chief of Italian defense, former chief of the Italian Air Force, now with the Italian Institute for Foreign Affairs. Really pleasure seeing you, sir. Thanks thank, so much. Thank you very much. Arrivederci. Grazie mille. Ciao.